Have you ever stopped to wonder if maybe some of the health advice we get all the time about exercise, sleep, might be, well, missing something? Something pretty fundamental, perhaps. Exactly. Like, what if our modern lives, our day-to-day, -day, are just really out of sync with how our bodies actually evolved over, you know, millennia? That's a huge question, and it's precisely what we're diving into today. We're digging into some really eye-opening insights uh, from a discussion with Daniel Lieberman. He's a Harvard professor, right? Yeah, focusing on human evolution, exercise, disease, sleep, nutrition, the whole picture. And his perspective is fascinating because he studied people all over the world, including hunter-gatherer groups. Which gives him this unique lens on, well, how differently we live now compared to how we're maybe designed to live. So think of this as um, your express lane to understanding that connection. Mm -hmm. between our evolutionary past and your health today. Trying to cut through the jargon and get to the core ideas. Our mission, really, is to pull out the biggest takeaways from his research. Some truths might even surprise you, maybe change how you think about staying well. Okay, so where should we start? Maybe with the whole idea of exercise itself. It's kind of weird from an evolutionary standpoint. Right, that story he tells about the Terahumara runner in Mexico. Oh yeah, the translator couldn't even find a word for training. Because for the runner, it was just... You run when you have to, or you don't. Exactly. It wasn't this scheduled, separate activity like our gym sessions. It was just life. It totally reframes it, doesn't it? Yeah. Our workouts seem almost artificial in that light. It suggests this separation is really a product of our um, comfortable modern lives. We don't need to move constantly for survival anymore. Like hunting or farming used to demand. Precisely. And that lack of necessity has consequences. It ties into that use it or lose it idea, biologically speaking. Our bodies expect activity, and when they don't get it, things start to decline. That's the evolutionary logic. And there are so many myths around exercise because of this disconnect. He apparently had to limit his book to just 10. Just 10. That shows how much confusion yeah. is out there. Okay, speaking of things we think we know, <laughs> sleep. The magic eight hours. Ah, yes, the eight-hour rule. Well, the research on non-industrialized populations, people without electricity and gadgets, tells a different story. What do they find? Less sleep. Generally, yeah. More like six to seven hours a night, typically. And interestingly, not much napping either. Six to seven. So where did eight come from? It seems to have really caught on more with industrialization, you know, needing set schedules. But the health data often shows this U-shaped curve. U-shaped, meaning meaning that around seven hours seems to be a sweet spot for many adults. Significantly less can be bad, but surprisingly, maybe significantly more isn't great either. You can actually sleep too much. That's counterintuitive. It can be associated with negative outcomes. Yeah, of course, people with health issues might sleep more, so it's complex. But the pattern suggests aiming for around seven might be more biologically normal for many. Okay, another big one. Sitting is the new smoking. How does that hold up against the evolutionary view? Well, the argument is that sitting itself isn't the enemy. Humans have always sat. Hunter-gatherers sat. Farmers sat. Probably for similar total amounts of time as many of us. So it's not the amount of sitting. It's the pattern. That's the crucial difference. Prolonged, uninterrupted sitting. That's the modern problem. Ah, so it's the sitting for hours without moving. Exactly. The research suggests that breaking it up, just getting up every, say, 10, 15 minutes, even briefly makes a huge difference. What does breaking it up do? It seems to kickstart beneficial things at a cellular level, helps with blood sugar, activates certain genes. It interrupts that long, stagnant period. So the advice isn't never sit. It's don't sit still for too long. Pretty much. Incorporate those little breaks, stand up, walk around, get some water, simple stuff. Makes sense. Okay, what about the 10,000 steps goal? Is that based on solid science? Uh, not exactly. The origin story is actually kind of funny. Oh, do tell. It basically came from a Japanese company selling pedometers back in the 60s around the Tokyo Olympics. A marketing campaign. Seriously. Yep. They picked 10,000 because the character for it looked like a walking man, and it sounded good, auspicious, no real science behind that specific number initially. Wow. But is it a bad goal? Not necessarily. Hunter-gatherers do tend to walk a lot more, maybe 10,000 to 18,000 steps. And studies do show health benefits plateauing for many people somewhere around 7,000 or 8,000 steps. So 10,000 is reasonable, just 
accidentally. Kinda, yeah. It's a decent ballpark figure, just good to know where it actually came from. It really highlights how easily these things become accepted wisdom. Now, Lieberman mentioned a big change in his own fitness routine based on all this. Right. He talked about realizing, despite loving endurance stuff like running, that he'd neglected strength training. And how crucial that becomes, especially as we age. Why specifically as we age? Sarcopenia. That's the age-related loss of muscle mass. It's not just about being weaker. It hits your metabolism, bone health, resilience. And losing muscle makes you less active, which makes you lose more muscle. Exactly. It can become a vicious cycle leading to frailty. So both endurance and strength work are key to slowing down aging at a cellular level. They trigger repair processes. Which connects to that interesting point about grandparents, evolutionarily speaking. Yeah, humans are unusual in living long past reproduction. The idea is that active grandparents historically contributed to the group, and that activity itself helped maintain their own health, triggering those anti-aging mechanisms. So the modern idea of retirement as just stopping being sedentary might be working against our biology. It's a very recent Western idea, and potentially, yeah, it cuts us off from those benefits of staying active and engaged. That really changes the perspective on staying active later in life. It's not just about fitness, it's deeper. Absolutely. And remember that Harvard alumni study he mentioned? The Paffenbarger study? Vaguely. What was the key finding? It showed the health benefits of activity actually become more significant with age. People active in their 60s and 70s had much lower death rates. Wow, so it's never too late, and it might even matter more later on. That's a really powerful message, especially if you're concerned about staying mobile and healthy as you get older. Definitely. Okay, let's shift a bit. Genes versus environment. How much control do we really have? The analogy used is great. Genes load the gun, environment pulls the trigger. Meaning genetics play a role, but lifestyle is the key factor for many diseases. Especially for many modern chronic diseases, yes. While genetics are involved, our environment activity levels, diet seems to have a much bigger impact on whether those predispositions turn into actual illness. That's actually quite empowering for the listener, isn't it? You have more agency than you might think. A huge amount. And physical activity is directly linked to lowering the risk of major killers. Like heart disease, diabetes. Alzheimer's too which makes the spending on prevention versus treatment seem, well, misplaced. That statistic was shocking. Only 3% on prevention in the U.S. When something like 75% of diseases are considered preventable, he called it a backward, stupid system. Hard to argue with that. He also connected activity levels to cancer risk in a way I hadn't heard before. Yeah, linking it to energy availability. Higher cancer rates in wealthier nations where energy, you know, food calories, is abundant. And cancer is like cells competing for that energy. Kind of like natural selection gone wrong inside the body. And high insulin levels, often from sugary diets and inactivity, can fuel that competition. They're considered carcinogenic. So being constantly awash in easily available energy isn't great. Especially if you're inactive. It creates an environment where cancer cells might thrive more easily. Yeah. How does exercise help specifically with cancer risk? Physically active people tend to have lower levels of certain hormones linked to cancer risk, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, insulin. Lower hormones. Interesting. And the stat about breast cancer was incredible. 150 minutes of activity a week, potentially lowering lifetime risk by 30, 50 percent. That's huge. Why isn't that headline news? It's a good question. It highlights a disconnect in how health information is shared. OK, let's talk inflammation. That seems connected to everything these days. Insulin plays a role there, too. Definitely. Insulin helps store energy. High glycemic foods spike glucose and insulin. Excess fat storage makes fat cells swell and release inflammatory signals. Leading to chronic, low-grade inflammation. Which is linked to all sorts of damage. But exercise is actually anti-inflammatory. How did that work? I thought exercise caused some inflammation. There's an acute short-term inflammation, but muscles also release this protein, IL-6, during exercise. And those exercise-induced spikes of IL-6 actually signal the body to reduce overall chronic inflammation. So our bodies evolved to use movement to keep inflammation in check. Essentially, yes. Historically, high activity levels and lower sugar intake meant we didn't need another system for it. We relied on movement. This all paints a picture very different from the sort of paleo fantasy you sometimes hear. Right. The idea isn't to perfectly mimic hunter-gatherers. That's probably unrealistic and maybe not even ideal. Their lives were tough. So what's the realistic takeaway? Any activity is better than none. You don't need to reach hunter-gatherer levels to get huge benefits. The health improvement curve flattens out way before that. 
just incorporate more movement sustainably. Which brings us back to redesigning our modern world. It's built for convenience, which often means inactivity. It's a massive challenge. The suggestion was focusing on nudges, not bans. Maybe taxing sugary drinks, making healthy food cheaper or more visible. And making activity easier, more fun. Like community dance classes, better walking paths, things that integrate movement socially. Plus, getting more focus on nutrition and exercise and medical training and funding. He mentioned that Swedish company Bjorn Borg, mm -hmm. where exercise was mandatory. Yeah, the CEO required a weekly sports hour for everyone. Apparently, some people left, but others found it really positive for team building. It feels like a tricky line to walk, mandatory exercise at work. It definitely raises questions about autonomy versus employer responsibility for well-being. Maybe supporting employee-led clubs or just fostering a culture of activity is a better fit for most places. It's interesting food for thought. Going back to the Terahimara, he mentioned a spiritual aspect to their running. Yes, that it wasn't just sport for them. It was deeply tied to prayer, a spiritual practice, a metaphor for life, something often missed in the popular focus on their physical ability. That adds such a different dimension. It wasn't just about getting from A to B. And many indigenous cultures historically had similar spiritual connections to physical activities. He also used his own experience with plantar fasciitis to illustrate another mismatch, our feet and our shoes. Right, how modern, supportive, stiff shoes can actually weaken the small muscles in our feet because the shoes do all the work. So the support becomes a crutch that leads to weakness. Exactly, leading to problems like plantar fasciitis. Insoles might help symptoms, but strengthening the foot itself addresses the cause. How do you strengthen your feet? Specific exercises. Spending time in minimalist shoes, going barefoot more often but gradually to avoid injury. It's another example of choosing short-term comfort over long-term strength. Which ties back to the hunter-gatherer physique. Mm -hmm. They weren't bodybuilders, were they? No, definitely not. Muscle is expensive energy-wise. They needed enough strength for their tasks, but excessive bulk would be a disadvantage when food is scarce. So more like lean endurance athletes. Or moderately strong individuals, yeah. Not the extreme muscle mass we sometimes see glorified today, which probably wasn't evolutionarily advantageous for their lifestyle. Okay, let's bust another myth. Running being bad for your knees. Such a common one. But the evidence suggests running does not cause arthritis, the wearing away of cartilage. Really? So all those knee injuries runners get? Injuries happen, yes, but they're often linked to how people run, not running itself. And some studies even suggest running might be slightly protective against arthritis by stimulating cartilage repair. How does running form play into it? Heel striking seems to be a big factor, putting more impact on the knee, and cushioned shoes might encourage that form. Whereas barefoot runners tend to land differently often more on the midfoot or forefoot, which acts like a natural spring and reduces knee impact. Humans ran without Nikes for millions of years after all. So the advice is focus on form, shorter strides, quicker cadence, avoid overstriding rather than just blaming running. That seems to be the more productive approach, yeah. So if running isn't inherently bad, what is the best kind of cardio? Ha, huh, the million dollar question. The expert view seems to be, the best exercise is the one you actually do. Consistency is key. Find something you enjoy. Exactly. Mixing it up is good some steady cardio, maybe some intervals, plus strength training. Cardio is foundational, but there's no single magic formula. Don't medicalize it too much. Makes sense. What about exercise for fat loss? That's always a hot topic. Well, the research suggests that lower amounts, like 150 minutes a week, don't usually lead to significant weight loss on their own. The calorie burn just isn't that high compared to intake. You need more exercise for weight loss. Higher amounts, maybe 300 plus minutes a week, can contribute, but it's usually slow. Diet plays a much bigger role in shedding pounds initially. But exercise is important for weight. Absolute crucial, especially for preventing weight gain in the first place, and critically, for maintaining weight loss after you've dieted. Ah, preventing regain. That's key. Huge. Studies on police recruits and those Biggest Loser contestants show that people who keep the weight off are usually the ones who maintain high levels of physical activity. Diet and exercise work together long term. That's a really important distinction. Okay, wrapping up, there was a strong message about compassion. Yes, a really vital point. Avoiding shame and blame for people who struggle with exercise, it can feel unpleasant starting out. The rewards aren't always immediate. 
that dopamine hit might take months or years to really kick in, especially if you're unfit or carrying extra weight, which adds its own challenges. So we need empathy. Definitely. And recognizing the power of social support, exercising with others, accountability partners, those can make a huge difference. Commitment devices, too, like those websites where you pledge money. A good reminder that it's not just about willpower. He also mentioned a personal friction point. Yeah, his own tendency to compare himself to others activity-wise and how he tries to manage that because it doesn't lead to happiness. Very relatable. Well, this has been uh, incredibly illuminating. Thinking about our health through this evolutionary lens really shifts things. It does. The core idea is that this mismatch between our evolved biology and our modern world impacts almost everything about our health. And understanding that mismatch gives you, the listener, more power to make informed choices. Choices about movement, sleep, food, all of it. So key takeaways. Any activity is good. Break up that sitting. Find movement you enjoy. Don't forget strength training. Be critical of health myths. And be compassionate with yourself and others. It's a journey. Definitely. So here's a final thought for you to mull over. Given everything we've discussed, what's one small change, just one thing? You could try today to nudge your lifestyle a bit closer to how your body might be designed to function best for the long haul. Something to think about as you try to navigate your own path to well-being with this new perspective.